amazing. It's amazing. The Michael Deacon program. 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 Is the embassy? Is the embassy? Is the embassy? Is the embassy? With me right now is Mr. Victor Hugo Vaca Jr. How's it going, my friend? Great. Thanks for having me on your show, Michael Deacon. Love that. No problem. And now you are officially on camera. And I love the artwork back there. I dig that. Uh, tell me a little bit about that artwork I'm seeing behind you. Sure. As a matter of fact, I will bring it up close. Oh, perfect. This is called Modern Art Gonzo Journalism. And the reason I created this work of art was because I was uh, in a court trial called the Crackhead Jesus Trials. And it's not about uh, Jesus Christ for those who are thinking that it's blasphemy. What it was was a tenant of mine in Florida got high on crack, went to work, got on his desk and proclaimed to his employees that he was the new Messiah and that they were now his disciples. So his wife called me in a panic and she says, oh, my God, my husband has a Jesus complex. He lost his job. So I went over to the apartment to uh, actually to the house to see what was going on. And he opens the door in his white robe and uh, speedos on and his gut hanging out. And I said, I'm here to collect the rent. He says, Jesus, don't pay the rent. <laughs> I said, listen, Mr. let's get footage of you walking across that pool. Bank of America is not going to believe that I'm renting to the new Messiah. So anyway, he takes me to the back by the pool, opens up a bottle of uh, Jack and starts taking me down the rabbit hole of what he was telling me was the litigation vortex and how the justice system is broken and how he was going to prove it to me by staying in the property and that he would uh, hire some Jewish lawyers and keep me tied up in the court system. And by the time that I would uh, have him out, I would have to pay him to leave. So at that time, I didn't know, but what he was talking about was squatters' rights, which now a lot of people in the United States know exists because people could just move into your property and you can't change the locks, you can't shut off the water, you can't shut off the electric, it'll be held against you. So how this gets to this artwork, the modern art gonzo journalism, which I had to create, 
It was presided over by Judge Donald W. Hefiel, who was the judge who presided over the Jeffrey Epstein cases in Florida, where he got the sweetheart deal and everything. I don't know if your audience is familiar, but Jeffrey Epstein was uh, in a Florida jail where he went there at night to sleep. But during the day, he was still able to procure victims and continue his pedophilia. So anyway, uh, I was making a film because I'm a film director as well, and it was called The Marketing of Peace. So I took my video camera into the court because I wanted to capture this court case since uh, Crackhead Jesus told me that it was corrupt. I wanted to capture it for the audience. And the judge, Donald W. Hefiel, told me, he goes, if I use his name, likeness, or use the videotape, or even talk about this case, that he would hold me in contempt of court and throw me in jail. Mind you, this was before the uh, um, cameras in the court trials, and I had to petition for cameras to be allowed into the court. So I'm one of the people who allowed, who made it so the cameras are allowed in the court now. The reason that was was because when back in the day you had court reporters, and they would sometimes not capture the essence of the trial. They would get the words wrong, or they would miss words. And also, they wouldn't capture the facial expressions of the judges, which were very important, especially if you watch the Alex Jones trials. You could see, or the, even the Trump trials, you could see how the judges were rolling their eyes or oh, smiling. Yes. You know, so it, it, you could tell that the fix was in. Now, the reason I knew the fix was in was because the lawyers, Alexander Condi and Aaron R. Cohen, who were uh, uh, throwing frivolous lawsuits against me because they wanted to keep me tied up in the court system, as crackhead Jesus warned me, uh, they told me as I was walking up the stairs that the fix was in. And this is how brazen they are. It was, oh, my father's friends with the judge, and they met last night, so you might as well just give up now because the fix is in. And at the time, I was in my 30s. I was idealistic, and I didn't believe it. And uh, lo and behold, it really was. So what happened was when the judge told me that I couldn't talk about it, write about it, I had a an existential crisis of my own. And I went home and I said, oh, my God, this is something that I need to tell people about. But I, I can go to jail if I do. So I, I just prayed and I, and, I, and I thought, what do I do? And then the voice spoke to me and it said, you know what? He never said you couldn't paint about it. He never said you couldn't create a diary of the world on canvas. And so that's when I started creating these cryptic works of art that I was constantly being uh, uh, impacted by the judge because he was saying that I was making a mockery of the court. Now, see, he was saying, I told you you couldn't use my name or likeness. And I said, well, I don't see where your name is because, I mean, this is a picture of a young girl. And I was trying to you know, point people in the direction of pedophilia and these uh, uh, judges and these courts protecting pedophiles like Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, very. And I put numbers in there, the Fibonacci numbers. One plus one is two, two plus two is three. Uh, um, you know, just the Fibonacci numbers. So I was, uh, and I also put the court case numbers because I knew that in the future, the, uh, um, the people would have the cell phones and they would be able to look up the court cases. And then I put images like this to show that the, the court was a circus. I put the clown in there and I put the dollars in there to show how corrupt the uh, court system is, that basically you could pay off the judges. And again, the Fibonacci numbers. And so instead of like, he would look at this and he'd say, oh, I see it says Judge Donald W. Hefiel, but I made it so cryptic that he couldn't hold me in contempt of court because it's art. And he didn't tell me that I couldn't paint about it. <laughs> That's so, brilliant, by the way. So here's some more of that. So yeah, it's, it's cryptic stuff. And uh, people were, I, I was really trying to communicate with the world to warn them about what's going on. And uh, now the world knows about Judge Donald W. Hefiel. So I, I took this stuff to uh, China with me, and I exhibited in China at the Art Canton in uh, 2019. And I brought the uh, Jeffrey Epstein case to the awareness of the people in China. So that was interesting, because I was the first artist that was allowed to exhibit uh, nudes in China and also to speak about free speech at uh, free speech forums. Oh, wow. I was invited in China on a 10-year visa to work with masters there and also to create films because my works were being censored in the United States. And so the Chinese invited me to speak at these uh, open forums, which were televised and broadcast to millions of people in China 
which is not a big deal when you consider that there's billions of people in China. But it was unheard of to have an artist speak about censorship. But the reason why they allowed me to speak about censorship was because I was letting them know that, listen, you know, the United States talks about free speech, but they don't practice what they preach. And I think mm. you're pretty aware, audience probably is, right now we're in an information war and it's on steroids right now, the censorship. So I agree. Yeah. It, it really is. And for those who don't know, Victor is an accomplished author and a creative visionary known for his uh, storytelling and compelling narratives. And of course, he's made significant contributions to various forms of media, including literature, film and theater. And uh, by the way, uh, Victor, I do want to say thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be talking to you. And we've got a lot of things to talk about here. And of course, we will be talking about uh, more of your background here in a moment, but I just wanted to quickly say, you know, when I first initially read your email and saw your name, I had felt like I've seen you somewhere before. And I remember, yeah, you were on Fox News and I do recall the movie Crackhead Jesus. And those were yeah. many, many moons ago in a very different time. And uh, I got to say, in regards to your interview on Fox News with Megyn Kelly, I recall the fake concern acting she did when she was first introducing you on the show and asking you these very fake outraged sort of um, questions, this gimmick that she was uh, portraying here. You know, she droned on about people who work for a living as she said it uh, when she herself is a TV anchor. I thought that was actually quite amusing. That's funny that you remember that because that was a, a classic interview. It was live. They uh bombarded me because they got I got the call I was in Washington DC I had driven from Florida to visit a friend of mine who lived in DC and uh when I got there I partied all night with this guy it turns out the people in Washington DC they they really party oh yeah so oh yeah so it's like five o'clock in the morning and uh he happens to be involved in um in the DC politics there. So he gets a call from Fox News and they said, hey, we heard that Victor Hugo's in town. Ask him if he'd like to come on and talk about free speech and censorship. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Granted, I'd been out drinking and partying all night and I had no sleep and I had just driven from Florida to DC. So that was like uh, uh, almost a 15 hour drive. So I went on live and with no sleep and uh, I don't want to say hungover, but definitely I had a, a little bit of a headache. Problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there, I'm thinking I'm going to be talking about art. And then you may recall, she starts talking about pornography. Right. And uh, reality. And uh, I mean, it was like three men, a woman and an ape or something like that. I don't know. Like She's so, like, yeah, how so can you was, call this art? And she, she said that a few times, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, that wasn't what I was expecting to talk about. Right. And this was live for me. And then she's so beautiful. She's like kryptonite to a straight guy, you know? Sure. So I have this beautiful woman first thing in the morning screaming at me, <laughs> uh, telling me, you know, how can I be condoning this stuff? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, what you're asking me to comment on, I've never witnessed. I've never seen it. Sounds pretty perverted to me. But uh, obviously, if somebody sees it as art... And, and and so the argument was about art. And I said, art is in the eye of the beholder. But one of the things that I noticed was that it was only supposed to go on for three and a half minutes. But you may recall that she just kept dominating the conversation. Right. She just kept throwing things at me, but she wasn't allowing me to answer any questions. So, like I said, it was early in the morning. I've got this gorgeous woman just screaming at me. So I'm staring back at her and I'm just like, OK, you know, is, am I dreaming? Is this real? You know, and, and uh, the producer just started going like this. He was like, listen, you know, let this keep going. So the segment was only supposed to be three and a half minutes. It lasted nine minutes. And uh, whenever she let me get a word in, I just totally calmed her down. I, I, I don't know. It was interesting because it's like when you're arguing with a woman, you know, you've got to let them speak. You've got to let them get it out. So I let her get it out. And then I complimented her, and I won her over with compliments. Wise words for those uh, listening at home. You know, so uh, uh, what I told her was basically, 
that I don't agree with the exploitation of men, women, children, or anything like that. So I, I don't find pornography to be an art form. But as a filmmaker, and I actually uh, uh, have been invited to be uh, uh, on a porn set. Yeah. And what ends up happening is it is, it's theater. That's why a lot of people are, are, are addicted to that pornography. And it really does ruin the mind because people think that that's real and it's not. And so that's what I explained to her. I said, listen, you know, uh, uh, um, whether it's Disney and I purposefully brought up Disney because I knew that Disney was also involved in like pedophilia and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. So you're talking about the subversive, which is even worse because uh, Disney... Well, I mean, for God's sake, she's a TV anchor. And that's why I said I was a little bit uh, thrown back when any any time a TV anchor drones on about people who work for a living, I always think, you know, you kind of have no leg to really talk about these sort of things because you never worked a day in your life. You rely on writers, producers, people who pamper you, the makeup people. You know, I, I generally don't trust anyone who's appeared on any uh, news show like as as an anchor, I, that that's the first red flag, by the way. Michael, I'm gonna share something with you. Yeah, go when ahead. You go, when you go back and you watch the interview, which you can find on Big Shoot or Rumble on YouTube, Victor Hugo, Megan Kelly, Fox News, you'll see the interview. There's some uh, subliminal images there that Fox threw in. First, when she starts talking about porn they throw an image of a painting from the Victor Hugo collection, which is a cock. Uh, uh, so I thought that was interesting. <laughs> and also, when she talked about uh, um, making a living, an honest living, she, she talks about men laying pipe down for a living. Right, which, right. Course, and Tandra. And then there were some other... Uh, uh, she, she also showed the... Uh, United Slaves of America painting that I did, which I thought was interesting. So there were a couple of things there that if you watch it closely, you'll be like, wow, they were throwing subliminal sexual innuendos in during that uh, interview that I did with her as well. I didn't catch them until after I, I watched it later and I saw what they had done. So there's a lot of subliminal images that are thrown in, even during broadcast. And it was interesting that they were talking about the uh, uh, the sexual free speech and at the same time promoting it on that newscast. So that was it was a very bizarre interview, but that put me on the uh, uh, radar because it was the first time that I was able to speak about Crackhead Jesus the movie to a major audience because before that, the title was getting censored because people thought, that I was blaspheming and that I was uh, mocking Jesus Christ, which is not at all the case. So I was surprised that they didn't censor that. I'd been uh, on the radar as far as like the canary in the coal mine when it came to censorship because of the title Crackhead Jesus, which was originally a graphic novel. And back in the day when there was Yahoo and Amazon and stuff like that as a, a, a source for communication on social internet, when I would type in crackhead Jesus, it would actually be censored. You couldn't even use that in communication at all. So I was like, wow, okay. But nobody was paying attention back then when I was trying to warn people about how they were subversively censoring. Nobody paid attention. And, and right. that's why I moved to peaceful protest because I was letting my brothers and sisters in the United States know that it's a slow creep. And, and so they were censoring me, but nobody cared because they figured, oh, well, I'm not going to use the term crackhead Jesus, so that won't affect me. And what I noticed was that there were ways around, around it. Because if I put the word crackhead in front of Jesus, then somehow the algorithms would say, no, that's a red flag. You can't have those two words directly in front of each other. But if I put them all together as one word, crackhead Jesus all one, then that would get through. Then that started getting caught. So then I had to actually put like a, a crackhead and then a capital J and then Jesus. So like I started playing with it, but I was learning how the system was programming itself to censor uh -huh. certain words that it didn't want to be put together. 
And now we're in the era where if you put bioweapons disguised as vaccines or COVID side effects or COVID vaccine, and you speak of it in a manner that doesn't go with the uh, New World Order's way that they deem it proper, then yeah, you get censored. So it's been kind of a strange trip, and not because I was meaning to be blasphemous, but just because of the situation that my tenant happened to have a Jesus complex and he was high on crack. That's where it comes crackhead Jesus. I actually I like say, the name uh, Crackhead Jesus. I actually want to put that on a T-shirt, by the way. Yeah, I've been trying to put it on T-shirts. I've had people saying to me, "Hey, listen, uh, let's, you know, can you? I'd like to buy that for Christmas and stuff like that." And uh, uh, I just every time I hire somebody to uh, work with me on uh, doing a merch yeah. site for my website, they end up uh, um, falling through. Put it that <laughs> way. I had one who was like, "Hey, Victor, I'm off the sauce. Can you give me a chance? I want to, uh, you know." work with you and i'm like all right cool and the next thing you know just before getting the website up he goes back on the on the wagon and so i, I don't want to hire some stranger from india either to right just yeah that'd be for, bad so if, so if there's a good uh website creator or anybody out there listening uh, contact me and let's see if we can develop a relationship a working relationship and and partner in selling some of my merch very nice uh, and by the way do you have a clip of that uh you and megan kelly Let's um, yeah, you, play that real quickly. If you'd, like, if you'd like to show it on your show, that would be great. Let the audience uh, oh, I could just see play the, how that works. I could just play the audio right now, by the way. Oh, okay, cool. I yeah, would just let this roll out. Protesting loudly, but some in the arts community are defending the move. Joining us now is one of those artists, Victor Hugo. He is live from our D.C. Bureau. Hi, Victor. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Kelly. How are you? I'm well, thanks. It's Megan Kelly. Yeah, that very luscious black long hair right there. You just had a little you know bit of uh, salt and pepper on, on the beard, but I mean, that long hair was still there. You know, it's funny. I, I got her name wrong right from the back. So oh, I yeah. Press I called her Kelly. Yeah, she didn't like that. She got really angry. So you guys didn't start off on the right foot. <laughs> uh, immediately, yeah, well, she, I, uh, she got mad. It was early. It was very early in the morning, so... <laughs> and I really don't watch much TV, so I wasn't really familiar with her name. Good times. The last name, but no worries. Oh, um, no, no worries. Uh, listen, we've been talking about this on our air because people got outraged when they heard about some of these projects, which are, you know, you, you're an artist, but even by artistic standards, you got to admit they're pretty racy. I mean, uh, uh, $50,000 to this this kinky art porno horror film complete with four men, three women, and a, and a gorilla. You clearly you can understand why people don't want their taxpayer dollars going to something like that, can't you? Well, I, I can see where people would be off guard about that, but I just want to say that I'm not in defense of poor taste. As an artist, I don't think any artist should be in defense of poor taste. As an artist, we should be trying to create beauty, especially in this uh, crazy mixed up world that we're living in right now. However, I do believe that we have to finance the arts because it's... Uh, fueling the natural evolution of civilization if we don't fuel and pay for the arts then that's going to be detrimental to our society okay so the arts sounds good uh you know museums artists but what about should we be paying twenty five thousand dollars for perverts put out join your fellow pervs for some explicit twisted fun as we apparently have Okay, with regards to that, I, I believe the fundamental question that Stearns was asking was not about uh, um, cutting off funding for the arts because he doesn't want to uh, uh, stop the freedom of expression. However, his point was, why are we funding artists that are not being uh, supported in the marketplace? And I think that is a good question. And as far as uh, the artwork being offensive, um, I have something called Crackhead Jesus, which is offending a lot of people. But the point of art is really to make people think outside the box. I have not seen these uh, works of art that are being complained about. However, before well, we're passing judgment them. on them, we're showing some but, of them. But I'd have to see the whole thing. See, the thing is, you're showing you're showing bites of it, and and that's something that's dangerous because you you can't just look at a piece of Van Gogh and that's then say, they're too dirty. "Oh, they headed out this, for you, by the way, here. Hugo." But that's that's because they're too dirty to show the whole Mr. thing. Hugo. We can't show you know genitalia uh, on our program yeah, uh, uh, at any hour, never mind the morning street. hours. And and, and well, that's fine. Even just the name. I mean, you know, perverts put out. Join your fellow pervs for some explicit twisted fun. People don't want their money. They, they, you know, Victor, 
This stimulus package came from taxpayer dollars, not just the so-called rich, but the middle class and the working class, people who, who go to work every day, work 12, 13 hours, come home and take care of their families, churchgoers, people who don't really want to fund porn or pervs put out. I mean, can't artists like you, even though you have some controversial projects, as you point out, object as well to sort of shut down these fringe groups from getting the money so that at least mainstream or or maybe slightly less than mainstream, but not these far weirdo groups would get this dough. Uh, I don't know. Again, I, I don't want to comment on them as far as being weirdo groups. I personally find the, the title funny. I think it would be, I guess, less offensive if they called it to catch a predator. Would that make it a little less <laughs> offensive to you? No, but I would I'd like not to have to fund anything that promotes uh, perverts having explicit explicit twisted fun which is not what to catch a predator is about to catch a predator is a legitimate news show that tries to put people behind bars no 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 and, and i agree with you on that megan but what i'm saying is the title the, the you had mentioned before that the title was offensive so i said well maybe if they change the title to catch a predator but i think what we're getting at here and and nowadays as artists and, and this is what the modern art music movement tries to do is we try to raise awareness by pushing the envelope right now with everything that people are seeing on the internet and hearing on the radio i mean nothing shocks anybody anymore so sometimes as artists in order to get your attention we have to quite literally grab you by the artistic throat and say okay now that we've got your attention let us educate you i'd be curious to see these videos and i'd be curious to see the reactions of the people um, one thing that i can give credit to these artists for is the fact that they are now getting us to have a, a discussion about art, which is something that is very important and that's lacking in this country. Now, well, there's and a real question about whether, about whether this qualifies as art. You know, I'll leave that to, to the uh, experts, which I am not when it comes to art, but, but I do understand the objection let, let me, let me of many people. That. But let me just the, finish my point, and then, and then you can make the last one. I do understand okay. the objection of taxpayers to saying, look, I, I don't go to work for 13 hours a day as somebody who lays pipe down for a living so that I can fund, and I quote, <laughs> nude simulated sex dances, Saturday night pervert reviews, and pornographic horror films. I got better things to do with my cash, with my taxpayer money, like you put away money for my, my children's college education, than, than, than to spend it on things like that. that that's a point I, I get and I think most Americans can get. And, and I appreciate that point, too. Uh, as an artist myself and as a tax buyer, I do. However, I, I disagree with your saying that you're not an art expert because art is obviously in the eye of the beholder. And some people may consider this art. It was obviously considered art. And that's why it was funded. Um, Don't you think, though, Victor, yeah, I, when you when you have to when you give out taxpayer dollars, there should be some discernment between projects that are generally accepted in the artistic field as I guess absolutely. mainstream, for lack of a better word, and projects like this. I mean, you know, if you take your argument to its logical conclusion, we could be putting uh, taxpayer dough into triple X porn. I, uh, you know what. Have you ever been on a film set? And, and, and I'm not defending triple X porn. I don't defend the exploitation of women or children. I don't defend the exploitation of anybody. But if you've ever been on a film set, it's art because it takes everybody to get together. It takes the producer. It takes the director. It takes the director of photography. It takes the catering people. I mean, making a film, whether it be porn or Disney, is an art. So it is what it is. And you don't have to like all the art. I mean, I, I don't like all the art. But that just means I don't You don't have to it. like it. I agree. Listen, we have the First yeah, yeah, yeah. Amendment. You don't have to like it. But the other point is you also shouldn't have to fund it. That's the, that's the point being made by these congressmen. Victor, you were a good guest. Yeah, you did great, by the way. Yeah, it, it wasn't bad for uh, no sleep and uh, hungover. Yeah, so, you did fine. The, the funny part was she is. She's, she's quite a gorgeous woman. So uh, I'm staring at her, and you could see she's really railing into me. Just, oh, yeah. And then the things she's talking about, I was so off-put because I wasn't ready for it. And she's talking about, like, three men, sex, and a, a gorilla. And I'm going, what the hell? Like, it, it, is this real? You know? So the whole situation was uh, uh, quite bizarre for me, actually. But, yeah, it got a lot of attention. It was the most watched segment on uh, Fox News that week. The producers told me that uh, that a lot of people had seen it, and it was trending. But they never had me back on, which was interesting. Because what I noticed about Fox is since I didn't bite into what – they always want people screaming at each other. Right, you know? yeah. And I didn't go for that. I let her speak, and I let her do all the screaming, and I just answered – appropriately really yeah you played it and, cool uh, which is what you're supposed to do at that at moments like that yeah and they didn't like that 
because uh, they would have preferred, you know, I, I, I don't even watch Fox News anymore, but it, it was getting to the point where it was ridiculous. People were screaming at each other on that. And I don't want to sit there on the television and right. watch people screaming at each other. So, yeah, that was that. But Very that was nice. an interesting. Thanks for playing that. At the end, you know what? I, I took a chance too. I noticed that she was a little bit heavy in the front, and uh, I congratulated her on her uh, baby. Oh, and I think I think I broke that news as well because uh, apparently she didn't really say anything. I, I, I'm glad she was pregnant because if not, I would have been horrified and embarrassed. You know? Oh, they would have uh, they would have slammed you for sure at that point. They said misogynist, they sh- fat shaming her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in the end it worked out. She was pregnant. That's good. Wow. Amazing. I you know, I didn't even catch that. I had yeah, no well, idea. Wow. Yeah, at the end she's uh, uh she told you know, she told me I was a good guest. And and what was interesting was the uh the place that I was defending the national foundation for the arts or something, yeah. I contacted them and uh, saw if they would help the modern art music movement, which is the fusion of art, music, film, fashion, literature, and education, fostering peace, love, and compassionate wealth worldwide. I said, Hey, listen, I was just on Fox. I was defending you guys with this uh, crazy stuff. You know, do you want to work with me with the modern art music movement? And they said, no. So I thought that was interesting. That's I'm weird. Like, wow. Yeah, that was weird. Because I was touring all over the United States at the time. I have synesthesia. So I hear wavelengths and frequencies and color. And uh, I have the ability to interpret music on canvas. So I performed with legends in the music industry, members of Bon Jovi, Cheat Trick, the Doobie Brothers, the Goo Goo Dolls. Wow. And I tried from New York to Las Vegas performing with uh, with big acts. I mean, collectively, they sold half a billion uh, albums. And I did that for a number of years. So I've had a couple of different uh, uh, careers. I used to be a, a, a businessman. Then I was performing with rock stars and uh, uh, members of the Whalers and stuff. And what I would do is I would create Rorschach interpretations of the event. I would capture the energy of the audience, the energy of the band, and the energy of the venue, and I would coalesce them on canvas. And uh, it would start with the blank canvas, and by the end, we would together create beautiful works of art. And so that's the modern art music movement. It was really uh, an amazing time in my life because I never planned that. It just happened. It just happened. Yeah, you lived a very interesting life, I must say. Well, the reason being, I think, is because when opportunity came, I seized it. Mm. Like that with Fox News. Really, I probably should have said no to the interview because of the state that I was in, having driven all night, not showered, not shaved, uh, had a couple of drinks in me and no sleep. I probably should have said no. But I said yes. And that changed my life because that reached such a large audience that it put Crackhead Jesus on the radar. Yeah. And then, it's interesting that so many years later, you still remembered that. Oh, of so course, was, yes. I, I re- as soon as I saw that email, and I'm like, why does this name sound so damn familiar? Then I did some more research on you. Before you send me those links, I actually looked up more of your work, and I thought, oh, my God, I, I do know this man. So, Michael, let me ask you. Sure. Because you're not the only one who said that. I've met people throughout my life who know me for that Fox News interview. What was it about that interview that was so impactful that made you recall that? Well, I, I remember the, the the fact that she treated you the way that she did is what made it memorable to me. Just that that emotion that came out of her and the sort of outrage sort of um, persona that she took on there. Whether it was genuine or not, it did stand out to me. And, those, and of course, Crackhead Jesus, that sort of, um, those names and uh, furthermore, I mean, perverts put out another thing that caught my attention. It made me giggle when I was watching this. It was actually my father I was sitting next to and he put on the, the uh, Fox News. You know, he watches Fox News quite a bit. And uh, even in the early years, I was watching because of my dad. 
Wow. So you were young. Very Bob young. Clinton saw that. I was very young when I saw that. Yes. Holy cow. So yeah, that must've been something that was like, holy. Yeah. The, the whole thing was bizarre. I'm telling you, I was there. I'm like, <laughs> what is <laughs> They had and it then, out for I, you, uh, Victor. They really did. They were really trying to stick it to you. Then, and now add to that, I'm assuming that you're straight and I apologize if you're not, but if you're a straight guy and you've got this gorgeous woman screaming at you first thing in the morning, I mean, it really yeah, is a little like, confusing. Yeah. Heck? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going, wait a minute. I don't even know you. Why are you screaming at me like this? What did I do? You know? Right. Yeah. It's like, we haven't even been together long and you're yelling at me. Yeah. Wow. That's funny. My you're not God. the only one. My goodness. Absolutely. And by the way, in, in, in regards to, you know, looking you up and seeing who you are again and remembering all these sort of things, in a recent video I found on Rumble, you were being accused of being a CIA Mossad operative, by the way. Yeah, those are the haters out there who can't seem to figure out ways of silencing me. So they have to make up ridiculous things. Uh, apparently, I am a CIA quadruple Mossad double agent, whatever that is. Yeah, I've never it's heard because, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, if I was CIA, I'd be the uh, the worst CIA. But I, I, I do understand why people sometimes assume that, because the CIA does have a history of employing artists to corrupt culture. So, I mean, during the 70s and all that stuff, and even in the uh, the 50s and 60s, and even now, you know, it's interesting, when I was performing with Skunk Baxter of Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers, before I got on stage with yeah. him, he had done research with me, and he automatically assumed that I was CIA as well. And I was like, he goes, hey, I heard you have synesthesia. I said, yeah, how'd you know? Because I did my research on you. He goes, I'm CIA too. I go, Ooh. you're CIA? He goes, yeah, I work for the CIA. So I go, well, I'm not CIA. And he goes, yeah, sure you're not. Mm. <laughs> so It is interesting I, that he said that because, you know, for a long time, I've always suspected, you know, members of the Grateful Dead perhaps were sort of loyalists for the, the CIA at one time, given the fact that there's so much free-flowing acid all the time. Yeah, totally. They were as well. You're absolutely right. They, they they would do that and then they would nab people. I got nothing concerts. against acid, by the way, for the record. I think acid is amazing. For the record. I've, I've never tried it. I've been offered the opportunity to do it. Oh, you missed out. I'm afraid that, uh, uh, that I would, I don't know. My uncle did it and he told me that every once in a while he would have flashbacks. And I didn't want that. You know, imagine me having a flashback while uh, Megan. Ke oh, Megan shit. Kelly's <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, Victor, what if I told you that I was, in fact, Jewish? What if I said I was a Jew? Hey, no problem. I sometimes self-identify as a fat black Jewish lesbian taco. Yeah, me too. In a man's Asperger syndrome. And a Soros Holocaust survivor who dated Anne Frank. <laughs> yes, so no I, I have so referred home. to myself as a black trans homosexual plenty of times. Yeah, age is just a social construct. And like Trump told uh, Kamala Harris during the debate, uh, she can be whatever she wants. That's to true. So that, that's the world we're living in now. It really is. It's a crazy world, but I'm not actually uh, Jewish or gay, by the way. For the record. That's okay. Yeah, well, it, you know. But I mean, I can be, depending if I get paid enough money, then I, I will definitely identify as those things for sure. See, I, I always carry this with me. Hey, this there you go. Sometimes, this is why sometimes people think I am a, a Jewish uh, quadruple CIA Mossad double agent, because if I get pulled over by the cops, I just put this you on. You put that on. There you go. Holy shit. <laughs> it's like Teflon. Oh, you know? And if somebody, if somebody starts accusing me of being an anti-Semite, I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. You're the anti-Semite. That's right. You, know? you, you should, I recommend everybody Damn. You can make these really off and just carry them with you and put it in your pocket. My God. It, it, it's like a cross to a vampire when uh, you're in front of a judge or in front of a cop. So That is brilliant. You know, I'm going to have to start doing that, by the way. 
Yeah, the still yeah, page man. out of your book. I play I play wow. the ultimate victim. Yeah, there you go. If somebody, if somebody says, oh, my God, you know, you, you, you're the things that you say. I say, hey, listen, I can't control the words that are coming out of my mouth because I have uh, Asperger's syndrome. I'm borderline retard. There you go. Stop being an stop being an ableist. I tell them. <laughs> That's nice. Yes. You got to cover all your bases and you definitely have. And another thing that I had seen in your background was your whole uh, sort of uh, upbringing through the U S Naval Academy. And uh, you were sort of talking about the hazing that you received. I saw that video as well. I had not known that about you, by the way, Victor. Well, you know, it wasn't so much hazing. That's what they called it. It was really torture. Torture. And yeah, and I had never seen such torture in my life. I actually didn't even get it as bad as my roommate, Thomas Vallow, who they told me was the weakest link and he had to be gotten rid of. So they tested me. They wanted me to kill him. And I didn't do it because I told them, I said, I thought we were supposed to help each other and not leave anybody behind. They said, yeah, but he's the weakest link, so we need to get rid of him, and you need, you're the guy to do it because you're his roommate. So anyway, because I didn't kill him, I ended up becoming what's called a shit screen. And uh, uh, they also tested me. They wanted me to kill my mother Whoa. during one of the holiday breaks, and they told me that they would protect me if, uh, uh, you know, that they would cover for me. They really told you they wanted to kill your mom. Yeah. And I asked them, I said, why do you want me to kill my mother? They said, if we ask you to do something, you don't ask us why. If we tell you to jump, you just ask you us jump. how high. Wow. And so I was like, well, what, did, what has she done? Because the thing is, first of all, you're not even really supposed to talk back to these guys because they scream at you and they're your overlords, essentially. They break you down to the point where you just follow orders, which by the way is why we're in the state that we're in right now, where it, we're being led by what I call toxic leadership at the highest levels. And they promote those who are the biggest order followers and homosexuals, by the way. When I was in the Naval Academy, it wasn't before the don't ask, don't tell. It was if you were gay, you were automatically uh, thrown out of the military with a dishonorable discharge. So that could impact the rest of your life because getting thrown out of the military with a dishonorable discharge uh, impacts your ability to get jobs and loans yes. and so on. And so, on. so, but there were people there that couldn't handle the torture and they would actually fake being gay just to get the hell out of there. So anyway, I wasn't going to do that because I'm not gay. So right. I wasn't going to lie. Yeah. So anyway, I was able to put up with it not just once but twice. I went through what's called uh, plebe summer and uh, um, the hell week twice, once at Newport Naval Base in Rhode Island where the Naval War College is, and once at Annapolis, Maryland near uh, Baltimore and DC. Anyway, when I was asking them why I should kill my mother, I was like, has she done anything? Is she a traitor? Is she treasonous or something? And they were like, no, 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 you just got to do it. If we give you an order, you just got to follow it. So I didn't understand until now why they were doing that to not only me, but to others, because they were grooming us. Because now, if you've noticed, they have given the military the OK to shoot American citizens and to attack American citizens. This has just been passed. So in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to groom people to be psychopaths and to be traitors. And that's what they were grooming me to be. I didn't at the time realize it. But then when I realized it, that's when the shift happened in my career where I was like, wow, I've got to use modern art, gonzo journalism to warn people. Because I also noticed that I was in the class of 1993 and I served alongside Carter Page. That's how I knew the whole Russian collusion thing was a lie. Because Carter Page is about as much of a traitor as I am, having served alongside him. And when I would talk to people, these people would tell me all these things about Carter Page. I'm like, have you ever met the guy? And they're like, no, 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 but I've seen it on Fox News and I've seen it on CNN. And I'm mm. like, well, I served with the guy. So I can tell you that this whole Russian collusion thing is a bunch of BS. So it's been kind of difficult because of the 
reality of my circumstance and, and the people that have been in my life that have made world headlines and my knowing that the fake news is fake. Very fake. From, even with the whole Megyn Kelly thing on Fox News, I saw the behind the scenes of that, you know? And I saw how the producer was like going like this and you couldn't see him on the television, but I could see him because he was in front of me and he was like, yes, yes, keep going, keep going. And uh, so it, it, it's just a big show. Yeah, it's no, it's no show. different. It's no different than uh, than porn, basically, as well. As you were alluding to with Megyn Kelly, I mean, it's the same shit, really. I mean, you have producers, you have people directing you. There's fluffers. There's it's a whole thing. Yeah, I'll tell you what. That whole porn thing is is very destructive, though. Yeah, I and, agree. Uh, yes. I when when I was invited on the porn set, I was invited by my lawyer, who wanted to have a meeting with me so he invites me to this mansion and i go to the mansion to have the meeting with him and i'm downstairs in the kitchen and i listen upstairs and there's all sorts of like screams and grunts and stuff going on i'm like what's going on he goes oh yeah sorry about that he goes uh, they're filming a, a porn scene upstairs he goes uh, one of my clients is away so i figured we could shoot that's what's so slimy about these lawyers you know like, first of all, he shouldn't have been having a meeting with me there, you know? And second of all, his client is gone, and he's using his client's house to film porn upstairs in the bedroom. I'm not even sure if the client knew about this. Probably not. And then he, invi and then he invites me upstairs and says, hey, you want to watch how porn is done, you know? And I'm like, wow, this was supposed to be a, a, a meeting, a serious meeting. And next thing you know, I'm, like, involved in some porn stuff going on. So, Yeah. Totally bizarre, man. My, my whole uh, impression of the legal system is shot. These people are really just corrupt, man. It's... it's, it's oh, there's a whole lot of that, down, yes. Yeah, once you go down that rabbit hole and you understand that uh, uh, the, how they control us with the birth certificates and maritime law and how the judges uh, are under basically uh, the Bar Association, which is the British... So we're still under British rule when you start going down that rabbit hole. It's just disgusting. It's, the United States is in a bad situation because the courts, and all the way up to the Supreme Court, by the way, a lot of those uh, uh, judges are compromised. So, yeah. Oh, yes. We're all ruled by the mighty dollar. Yeah, uh, we've got to get rid of that uh, uh, fiat currency because that's what's – destroying everybody it's not backed by anything sound it's uh, uh, um we need to back it by gold or silver and until we do that and they're able to print it out of nothing then they're able to bribe people and blackmail people because they create the money out of nothing right and people don't don't understand that a lot of people don't and speaking of which you yourself are not in this country currently, and I thought you could sort of give us a rundown on how you ended up being in, in uh, Georgia. Yeah. Well, earlier I told you that I was invited by the Chinese right. to reside in China on a 10-year visa to work alongside masters in the art world. And uh, I was more than happy to do that, first in peaceful protest to warn my brothers and sisters in the U.S. that – they were pointing the finger at the Chinese for censorship. Meanwhile, censorship was creeping into the United States in a way that was going to impact us the way it is now. So when I moved to China, I realized, wow, this is strange. I have more free speech in China than I actually do in the United States. Mind you, I'm not condoning communism at all. And it is Big Brother 1984 on steroids over there. There were cameras everywhere. You dare not uh, jaywalk because... They will capture you and they will find you. They have a social credit score. I had to get a cell phone, which I currently don't own, by the way. I haven't had a cell phone in four years. I live off the grid and I'm very happy about that. I don't have to worry about likes on Facebook or uh, uh, Instagram or anything like that or all that gossip that goes on there. I notice people walking down the street and they're busy taking selfies, making pretend that they're having a, a like the most fabulous life. <laughs> The moment that they're done taking that selfie, they go back to being sad and alone. Yeah, back to reality. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, give me a break. So anyway, 
it's really weird not having the cell phone because I sit around and I watch people at restaurants and stuff. And I notice the couples, the woman's on her phone, the guy's on his phone. Right. They're not dating to each other. So it's, it's surreal. So even there they do that. Oh my God. In China, it's even worse. Oh my. Uh, uh, trains there. First of all, what was really interesting about China was they have uh, uh, what they're doing now in the United States, in New York, where they check your bags and everything, mm -hmm. and and you have no privacy there. But the reason they were doing that in China was because the Muslims started doing terrorist attacks. So they immediately set up uh, uh, um, checkpoints everywhere, and you have to get your luggage checked, your handbags checked. They uh, scan you, and so uh, again, you're living in an area where the, you have no privacy. The thing about China, also, they told me when I got there, because the U.S. State Department was like, "Listen, you're probably going to have spies on you because they're going to think you're a spy." And uh, so I did. I had my handler. His name was Huai Ping Wang, and uh, uh, then they told me you can't talk about the three T's: Tiananmen Square. Tibet and Taiwan. So I made sure I didn't talk about that. And also, you're not allowed to watch pornography. If you watch porn, they monitor, I don't know how they do this, but they monitor everything that you are watching on your internet, even if you have a VPN. They have a very strong firewall there. So I've known people that didn't believe that, and they would get a knock on their door at 3 a.m., and the police would show up. And they would arrest the people for watching porn. Wow. Porn, porn. Yeah. And also, you're not allowed to use Twitter. You're not allowed to use YouTube. You're not allowed to use um, uh, Facebook. And yeah, there were certain things you're not allowed to use over there. And so I got used to that because I was like, you know what? I, I really don't need Yeah, you don't really care anymore. about that. Yeah, I was more focused on creating and working with the people the whole time that i was there i was constantly in meetings and i was in meetings with uh advisors to xi jinping so i really got to understand what's going on in the united states by being outside of the u.s the reason being is first i noticed that inside the u.s they really dumb down the education system so most people even if you have a phd are dumber than dirt Whereas the people outside of the U.S. most speak more than one language. And that's even in countries that are like poor. So speaking another language is, is very important. And it's a shame that most Americans only speak English. But on top of that, they teach you American history. I learned more about American history when I was living in China mm. than the United States. And so that's why China and Russia and other countries are able to beat us is because they know the mistakes that we've made in the past through our wars and through our uh, corrupt governments. And so they're just sitting back right now watching us repeat history, but they're egging us along because the Chinese, they've infiltrated the education system. They've infiltrated the government, just like Israel has with APAC. And so being outside of the United States, I'm like, wow, the U.S. is not really the U.S. It's controlled by China and Israel. And what we're watching is just a show. And they control these people through blackmail, through honey traps. And, uh, yeah, they weren't afraid to tell me all this stuff. They were, they were showing me the uh, Biden laptop when I was living in China. I saw what uh, uh, the fake news media in the United States was claiming was just fake. The Chinese were using it to blackmail the United States. That's quite and, interesting. Um, the reason I had to meet with the advisors to Xi Jinping was because of the work that I was doing. Because I was he holding forums about free speech and uh, exhibiting nudes, those were things that were revolutionary in China. They had not been done before. So they had to make sure that I wasn't going to go there and start badmouthing China. And I, I wasn't bad-mouthing the United States. I was just telling the truth that the United States is not what it claims to be when it comes to free speech. And so the Chinese were saying, yeah, look, see, this guy's showing the hypocrisy of the United States. 
I wasn't going to badmouth China because I was there as a guest. Right, exactly. You know, their their politics is not my politics. My politics is the USA. And uh, yeah, you're just a I visitor, was, so a smart move in your on your part. Yeah, and because I did that, they realized that I could be trusted, and so I met people at the highest levels there who shared information with me, which allows me to have the worldview that I have to the point where I even realized, I'll never forget, a multi-billionaire who has a high level of, uh, 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 um, he works at the highest levels in the United States. That's what's so amazing about the US too. I'm not gonna say who this person is, but he is involved in stuff that is uh, military in the United States. Mind you, this guy is CCP, okay? Anyway, his wife's an artist, so he uh, liked my work. He invited me to his uh, uh, his mansion. The the billionaires there, they they live really nice. And with tears in his eyes, this strong, powerful man is telling me about how on September 11, 2001, he was supposed to go to the World Trade Center to do a deal, a banking deal, a multi-billion dollar deal, which back in 2001 was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. He'd been working years, and he says that he was contacted uh, a few hours before and told not to go to the meeting. And he was arguing with the people, saying, no, I've been working on this deal for so long. i got to go. i got to go. They said, no, don't go. There's going to be an attack. So he said he didn't go to the meeting, but he did go to the downtown area, and he witnessed the, uh, the attack Ooh, on the World and he said with tears in his eyes how he was watching people fall from the skyscraper and everything and mm. uh, uh, bodies on the ground. Yeah. And he realized that that could have been him because he was supposed to go to that meeting. So he told me, he says, no, Victor, that was an inside job. He says, we knew. The Chinese knew about it. So if the Chinese were warned ahead of time, how come the American citizens weren't warned ahead of time? And uh, that struck me. That really did. And then now living here in this gateway country between Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and the EU, I've met some of uh, the bin Laden family. And these people are super nice. You know, they paint them out as terrorists and everything. Meanwhile, the real terrorists are at home. They're in uh, the White House. I agree. There's a, there's a coup going on in case people haven't noticed. And shame on Trump for playing along with this because he's making pretend that there's a real election going on. He should be stating, hey, listen, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, you guys stole the election. Why are we playing along with this? I don't understand. There seems to be some kind of like a psychosis in the United States where they're, they're believing that somehow if they press that Dominion button any harder this time, it's going to make a difference. You're using the same machines. The 2022 election was stolen. The governor of Arizona is still allowing the borders to be open. Nothing has changed. So it's it's kind of strange. And, and I can tell you, the world knows that the election was stolen. The Russians in their textbooks for their children are teaching that the election was stolen. So why aren't the textbooks in the United States teaching this? Right. And that's a question I always ask uh, many guests. And I don't really ask them this question. I just say, I wonder how history will remember some of these events that have come and gone, uh, like 9-11 and the election, for instance. Uh, I wonder how history will remember that, and especially like something like January 6th and how there was all sorts of uh, activities going on with different different alphabet organizations as well. I've learned that in order to understand American history, you've got to get out of the United States because you will find more books about American history in Asia and in the former Soviet Union. And the reason why is because these people want the freedom that the United Slaves of America have taken for granted. And so what I'm learning is that they're learning from our mistakes, whereas we're repeating the mistakes. And it's really sad because uh, the United States as a constitutional republic 
was a beacon of freedom for the world, but it's turned into the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I agree. And now it's joke around the world. So a lot of it has to do with the spell casting because they have people convinced that it's a democracy and it's not. It's a republic if you can keep it. And we've done miserably in keeping it. People don't understand what a democracy is. And it's shameful to hear even Trump using the word democracy because it's not. For those who don't know, a democracy is this. Uh, the illegal aliens move into your home. There's 10 of them. And you're there with your wife and your daughter. So there's 13 people in the house. So 10 of the people in the house say, you know what, we're going to vote. We're going to vote to be able to rape your daughter and rape your wife and to take the uh, bedroom and you and your daughter and your wife after we're done raping them in front of you, are going to have to sleep in the garage. All in favor vote yes. So 10 people raise their hand and vote yes. And of course, the three vote no. They're outnumbered. That's a democracy. So in a democracy, you're going to have to sit there and watch your wife and daughter get raped in the name of democracy. That's not what a republic is. A republic is different. So I know that's kind of an extreme example. But we're living in a day and age where kids are being sent home in kindergarten with fisting kids. So I don't think that's that extreme of an example anymore. Not exactly. And by the way, let me just ask you this. Do you believe that the American dream is dead, essentially, especially in the year 2024? Yeah, I really do. And it's a shame because my father and mother were immigrants and they, they uh, uh, came to the United States as uh, um, legal immigrants, and they worked their way up, and they did everything that they had to do, and they were uh, patriotic Americans, and uh, uh, you know, they, when they came to the country, they actually um, migrated from Ecuador, and in Ecuador, they had a good life because uh, they had maids, and my mother, she came from uh, uh, Spain and Italy, so they actually had money and stuff. Yeah, they had some wealth, they, in other words. Well, so so they actually came to the United States and they worked as uh, janitors. My mother worked as a house cleaner. And so even though it was beneath them, because in their own country, they wouldn't have to do that, they wanted to make an honest living. And then eventually my father uh, worked his way up and, and my mother did as well. And they held very good jobs and good positions and they were able to raise a family, honestly. Yeah. I never needed for anything. My father was able to, uh, he worked for Pan American Airlines, and uh, he took me all over the world before I was 13 years old. I've been to every continent except for Antarctica. And I experienced firsthand what Egypt is like. I've seen the pyramids. I went to Israel. I went to Syria. I went to Jordan. I went to Palestine. I went to Gaza. I went to the West Bank. I went to Jordan, Syria, all these countries. And so I have a different worldview because my father said, I want you to see the world and not just read about it in books, which also got me in trouble in school because I missed a lot of days. I was absent for 45 days. And so they were going to threaten to hold me back. And it wasn't that I was getting bad grades. I was getting A's. But the teacher said, your son misses too many days of school. So my father would go to the principal and he would be firm with them and say, listen, you're not going to hold my son back. Right. Uh, he's doing well in school and nothing that you're teaching him in these textbooks uh, compares to him actually seeing these things in person. So it was kind of weird because I would be sitting in school and the teachers would try to teach me things. And then I would go, but wait a minute, I was just there. And what this book says is different than what I actually saw. So then the teacher would like send me outside because she thought I was being a wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he thought you were being a troll of sorts. But I, I agree with you. The American dream is, in my opinion, dead as well with declining birth rates and plummeting relationship rates. It's hard not to feel that way. Everything uh, has increasingly, uh, everything has in increased in expenses these days. You know, leading 
many questions to whether achieving that dream is still possible for everyday Americans, basically. Yeah, I honestly don't know, Michael. Uh, I, I would love to go back home. I've not been home in almost seven years now. And in these seven years, I've been in lands where I don't even speak the language. I, I never learned Chinese. I don't know how to speak Georgian. I don't know how to speak Russian. So I have been feeling like a stranger in a strange land for seven years. However, I feel safer here than I do if I were back in the United States. You know, one of the one of the last memories I have before moving to China, I stayed at the uh, uh, hotel across from Madison Square Garden in New York for a month, and it just so happens that that was Pride Month, and I couldn't understand why when I walked outside of the uh, hotel, I saw old men walking around completely naked. Oh my! With their dangling, and there were little kids uh, walking around them. I, I, I was like, what's going on here? So I called a friend of mine. I said, hey, listen, I got a hotel room in, in New York for a month. Come hang out. And he comes, and I said, what's what's going on with all this like naked stuff? He goes, oh, man, you're here for Pride Month. I said, oh, my God, what is that? I thought they only had a day. He goes, no, they've given them a month now. <laughs> so, so my last month in the United States was just watching like Old guys with little dicks swinging them around everywhere. I was like, man, I can't wait to get out of this country. Personally, I'm Jewish, I'm a trans woman, and I'm queer. And those are related. So that's what that was like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least no one hit on you there, uh, Victor. Oh, my God. Holy cow. That would have uh, really uh, confused you there. <laughs> hey, by the way. Not on. This country that I'm in right now, they just outlawed LGBTQ, and it was unanimous, 84 to zero vote in the parliament. Oh wow! There will be no, there will be no Pride Month here. There will be no uh, books put in children's schools that are pornographic or anything like that. Even the uh, uh, they don't allow like OnlyFans or anything like that. This is an Orthodox Christian country that I'm in, and uh, I feel very safe here. And uh, it's it's nice. I mean, it's it the, the people here. They were uh, again, whether you're atheist or you're agnostic, there's something to be said about norms. And it's not normal to just be walking around naked and doing sex acts in front of children, no matter where you are. That's inappropriate. I agree. And somehow that has become normalized in the United States, and it's not right. Yeah, the, the, the radicaliza radicalization of a, a lot of these things has uh, really taken a lot of people back. And I'm not a conservative type at all, by, by any means. But yeah, I, I have noticed some people are really getting very liberal with a few things, especially these nudist colon colonies and people having these pride months and kind of letting it all hang out in front of children, mind you. Yeah, that, that it's like there's no sense of there's no sense of decor anymore these days. Victor. It makes for a lost generation, but one of the things that I've been harping on and why I've been blacklisted from shows, and I thank you, Michael, for daring to have me on your show, is because I was wondering this myself. Again, when I left the United States, I noticed that there was a storm of depravity coming. And so I went to a country that was totally communist and wouldn't allow that. In China, there's gay, but it's subversive gay. The gay there, you can't flaunt it. If you yeah. want to do it, you have to do it in private. And it's at your own risk because they will arrest you for being gay. So I did see gay. What was interesting was, and this is how subversive the U.S. is and why the world, I don't want to say hate, but why they strongly dislike the U.S.A. The gay goes to China and they go there as teachers and they teach the children mm. there. Uh, um, I was noticing that there were a lot of expats there who were gay and working in education, teaching English to children. And uh, of course they would lie about it and everything, but my gay dog's pretty good. And plus these people were, were very forward when they were away from the schools. 
with their homosexuality. So that's how they infiltrate these countries with that perversion is subversively through the children. And I was noticing that in, in China as well. Sad. It's very again, sad. I, I have nothing against gay people. I, I always say I wish 99.9% .9 of men except for me were gay because this way I could have all the women to myself. Right. You know? Yeah. I would love everybody. All men should be gay except for me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we don't have no problem with the gays, no doubt. Uh, but yes, it, it's becoming a pretty much an issue these days, uh, especially with teachers being very open about their sexuality and being so freely talking to minors about their sexuality, which is very adult. In uh, my opinion, that shouldn't be going on in any school, really, whether you're straight or gay. Uh, talking about those sort of things is a little, a little too much, in my opinion. Michael, I meander sometimes, and I, my train of thought was lost when I uh, was telling you one of the reasons why I get blacklisted on shows is because I mentioned the Talmud. And the reason why it's important to know about the Talmud Oy is vey. because the Talmud is what enables the pedophilia, because it says that it's okay for a man to have sex uh, with a child as long with as a child. the child is sold. And also it mentions that you can actually have sex with a child if it's three years old in one day. Correct. And the reason why you can do that is because apparently the hymen uh, 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 repairs itself. Correct. And the Talmud also states that it's okay for a Jew to lie. Uh, it, it's okay for a Jew to use lies to circumvent the non-Jews. Correct. And, I mean, there's, um, no, there's no lies there. I mean, these are things that were written about a very long time ago. And it's fascinating to watch the unfolding situation in Israel. Many people believe that America has become, in many ways, the United States of Israel. Given the substantial resources and taxpayer dollars allocated to support it, uh, recently we've also seen significant funding directed toward Ukraine and other countries as well. I don't need to bore you with all the facts, but it's fascinating how Israel has become what they have long claimed to oppose. In terms of being quote unquote Nazis of sorts. Well, most people don't realize that the highest uh, level Nazis in Germany were actually Jews. And uh, uh, they have books about it. I didn't learn about this until I, again, until I left the United States. These yeah. People were like, oh, yeah, you haven't heard about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hitler's uh, Jewish soldiers? And I said, no. They said, yeah, his driver was a Jew. And uh, a lot of the people close to Hitler were actually Jews. And a lot of people don't even know this. Hitler didn't want to kill the Jews. He just wanted them out of uh, Germany because they were destroying it because of the Weimar Republic. So his whole thing wasn't about even killing the Jews. The problem is that the Jews have taken over the textbooks, have taken over the news, have taken over Hollywood, have taken over radio. They've even taken over the alternative uh, media. Outlets. I agree. You're not getting the full story, and it's really easy to change history. So they've demonized Hitler to the point where you're not even allowed to point out the facts anymore. Oh, no, but not at again, all. When you leave the United States, I see copies of uh, Hitler's books out here on the street. Mein Kampf? Sell yeah, in different languages and stuff like that. So I've read that. I mean, you really should read these books to understand what's going on. And uh, people say that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a forgery. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You see how they manipulate with spellcasting. If you understand what the word forgery means, that means that there's an original somewhere. So they say, oh, yeah, but that's a forgery. Yeah, okay, that means there's an original somewhere. That means somebody copied from an original the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So you should read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to understand what's going on right now. You should also read the Rules for Radical, Saul Alinsky, to understand what's going on right now. And you should definitely familiarize yourself with the Talmud and the Zohar and uh, understand why it is that even the best of non-Jews should all be killed. Well, let's just say they, the tried to, they tried to warn us a long time ago. Let's just put it that way. Who's they? Well, the Germans. Hitler. Oh, yeah. They tried to warn us what was going to happen. 
Yeah, they really did. And it kind of and, unfolded uh, in just that way. It's totally. The United States is like the Weimar Republic. Most people don't understand what the Weimar Republic was. But, I mean, when, when you study the Weimar Republic, it got to a point of deviancy where the people were having sex with goose or geese. Yeah. And, and then after they were having sex with the geese, they would make the fro frog gras out of it. They would eat it. And then they got to the point where they were having... People were so hungry and so starving that they would have sex mother and daughter teams. And then after they would kill them, so it would be like they were making snuff films. Right. With mothers and after having, I mean, and this was like documented stuff. And so Hitler came in and he said, this has got to stop. And it was the Jews that were behind it, just like the Jews are behind it right now in the United States with Pornhub and OnlyFans. I mean, these things are being led by rabbis. And it's basically the, the new normal, in other words. Well, that's exactly what they're trying to do. That's yeah. why the United Nations is trying to normalize pedophilia. I don't right. know if you... Minor like, attractive uh, uh, people, they say. Yeah. So that's like a slippery slope. And, and I'm shocked whether people want to say that they're conservative or not, or whether they want to say that they're Christian or not in the United States. This is inappropriate. You cannot be having sex with children. It's just innocence lost. Yeah, and all the and people who watch Fox News, they all pretty much support Israel. And people that uh, support Israel basically are supporting the Talmud and these things that they oppose. I call them satanic Christians because these people on the one hand, they pretend that they are uh, pious and self-righteous. But on the other hand, how can you be condoning genocide? Right. And that's what they're doing because the uh, uh, Israelis, they just killed a bunch of Christians recently, too, in Lebanon. So they're not just killing uh, Muslims. They're killing Christians, too. And these Christians are supporting that because somehow they believe that these people are God's chosen people. Right. As if God is a Muslim agent. And by they, the way, they, speaking they, they, of... Um, spe Sorry to cut you off there. I was just, I was going to quickly mention, speaking of uh, Israel, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu released a video message uh, after the Hamas leader was uh, killed there. He said that um, the leader, his death does not mean Israel will end its attacks in Gaza. Today we have settled the score. Today evil has been dealt a blow out. Our task has still not been uh, completed. And he said to the dear hostage families, I say this is an important moment in war. We will continue full force until... All your loved ones, our loved ones, are home. And that is from our friend Benjamin Netanyahu. And again, it's crazy to see how Israel has become that thing they, they claim to oppose. I don't know if you know, or if your listeners know, the reason why they're doing this is because they're trying to bring back the Antichrist. I know it sounds crazy, but these people, uh, they're known as the synagogue of Satan. Right. And so... They believe that if they manifest this war, which was uh, talked about, Albert Pike wrote a letter. Oh, yes. To, uh, and he, this was, I think, in 18... That's uh, about the prophecies, basically. And it's funny how they spell synagogue when the original spelling was S-I-N and uh, not with a Y. And, of course, the star David also represents, you know, Saturn, which is uh, satanic, in other words. Totally. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing, it, it's, it's, it's it's pretty crazy. It's in your face. They put it because symbolism will be their downfall. They have to let you know it's natural law. And if you accept it, then so be it. And that's what's happening is people are not even realizing that they're being killed. And it's they laugh about it because they're using taxpayer dollars to kill the taxpayers and to kill the citizens. And again, it goes back to my training at the U.S. Naval Academy and how I was being groomed to be one of those psychopaths because uh, in order for me to move up higher in rank, I would have had to have killed my roommate, killed my mother, and lied about the uh, sexual assault of a female midshipman that I witnessed. And they were offering me the world. They literally told me that if I looked the other way or said that I wasn't sure about what I saw, 
that they would groom me to be a congressman or a senator, and that I would eventually be the first Hispanic American president of the United States. Oy vey. And they, they said this in front of my father at a meeting that I had, which was a secret meeting with Vice Admiral Virgil Hill and a bunch of uh, uh, guys from D.C., and they were all there trying to convince me that what I had witnessed was wrong because it was making headlines in the uh, all the newspapers, Washington Post, New York Times, and World Headlines. This was before the Internet. If this would have been on the Internet, who knows what would have happened. But right. they squashed the story. And uh, uh, that's when I had a, a knife to my throat and a gun to my head was because I was told that if I spoke about what I had witnessed, that they would throw me overboard on an aircraft carrier or that they would uh, push me into the engine of a fighter jet and my guts would be swept overboard and that my family would receive a folded flag in a wooden box and told that I died honorably in the line of duty. So when my father was like, wow, he said, uh, uh, they said that they're going to make you president of the United States. That's great. I said, listen, Dad, these guys want me dead. My father was like, no, no, no. They said that they're going to protect you. Don't worry about it. I said, Dad, these guys can't protect me. I said, the moment that you leave and the moment that I lie, they're going to kill me. So uh, my father was very disappointed. It, it, it completely ruined my relationship with my father because he had the visions of grandeur of me being a congressman and a senator and mm. the first president. But uh, I guess he believed me when I told him that my life was at risk. And so I got an honorable discharge, so I am a veteran. I have people who claim that I am a, what is it, a stolen valor, which is a bunch of bullshit, because what people don't understand is that the war is at home. And I served my country at home by being honorable, by having integrity, by speaking up, by being a whistleblower. That's what we need now to save the republic. We need people to stop being afraid. We need people to stop being order followers. Because that's what's killing us. These people who are at the border and letting these illegal aliens come in, they're all traitors. The people in the military that are pressing the buttons that create these uh, weather weapons, that create these hurricanes, they're traitors. The people who control the directed energy weapons that do what they did in Lahaina, Hawaii, which is a land grab, those people are traitors. And I know that because when I was in the military, they were constantly wanting me to do things that were wrong. Right. And I, and because I stood up, I got in trouble. But I'd rather get in trouble than do things that will hurt people. And so that's the problem. You've got these doctors. You've got these nurses who, oh, I, I'm just doing my job. So I'm giving these kids these scenes that will either kill them or ruin their lives forever with these uh, side effects. Or you have these doctors who are like, oh, I'm just doing my job giving people remdesivir and putting them on ventilators. I know it'll kill them, but my hospital gets an extra $25,000. So, hey, I'm just doing my job. I mean, it's people don't understand. Serial killers aren't just in movies dressed up like Jason or Freddy Krueger. Serial killers are your neighbors, the doctors, the lawyers, the people who the are... Judges. The judges. The judges, yeah, the serial killers are all over the United States right now. And people don't want to accept that because it's a hard pill to swallow. But if your mother's a nurse or your father's a doctor or a judge or a lawyer and they're allowing this stuff, if your father's a sheriff and he hasn't arrested uh, uh, Anthony Fauci or any of these criminals, then yeah, they're aiding and abetting in these crimes. And so that's what we've got right now. We've got Kamala Harris, who's a criminal, going up against Donald Trump, who's also a criminal. Because if he was really the commander in chief, he would have the military arrest these people, hold tribunals, and ex execute the traitors publicly. Until there's accountability, the United States is going to be lost because the world has lost all respect for it. I agree. And I, as I like to say, there's nothing more frightening than reality. And Victor, I must say, I would love to talk to you for another hour here, but I am pressed on time. And, you know, I do thank you for being a part of the program. Loved having you here. I'm going to have to bring you back on again. 
And we'll get down even deeper into all these sort of issues. But Victor, definitely plug anything you'd like, my friend. The floor is all yours. I just want to plug the bravery of those men and women who are willing to put their lives on the line by being whistleblowers. At this point, really, you have to step forward if you know things that are not right, because they're trying to kill us anyway. So this is kill or be killed, and whistleblowers have to step forward. And uh, if you're looking at one right now, at the age of 18, I had a gun to my head and a knife to my throat, and now I'm 54 years old, I'm still here. So don't be afraid, don't live in fear. You can do this, but you have to do the right thing. And uh, you can follow me at victorhugocollection.com. You can scroll to the bottom of the page and you can find my channels on Rumble and BitChute. And yeah, don't be afraid, people. Remember, united we stand, divided we fall. Never give up. Never surrender. Keep shining. Live, love, flow. And thank you, Michael Deacon, for daring to have me on your show. I appreciate your bravery. Clockwise, my friend. Thank you for being you and being brave all these years and not letting you stagnate you in any kind of way. Uh, much love and respect to you, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.